Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Tika Benvenisti. Dr. Benvenisti received her PhD at UCLA in immunology, and then she did postdoctoral training in neurology and tumor immunology, at which point she started her career at UIB Birmingham in 1986. And at Birmingham, she has a meteoric rise, um, and she now holds several leadership positions. So she holds the Alma B. Maxwell Endowed Chair. She's also professor and founding chair of the Department of Cell, De Cell Developmental and Integrative Biology, one of those newfangled departments. Um, she also serves as the Associate Director of Basic Science at the UAB Comprehensive Cancer Center and as Senior Associate Dean for Research Administration and Development. So currently, she is the past president of the American Society of Neurochemistry, and she was elected as a fellow in the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2009. She also serves on several editorial boards and has chaired many NIH study sections. So in spite of these many administrative commitments, um, Eddie has maintained a very, oh, sorry, Tika. She likes Tika. Tika has, has maintained a very active research program. Um, she's a recipient of several grants to conduct research on the JAK-STAT pathway, and she works on neurological diseases, neuroinflammation, and glioma. But she also investigates the role of protein kinase CK2 in glioblastoma. So Khalil and I became acquainted with Tika a couple years ago at the last CK2 meeting, which was in Poland in 2013. And we are very fortunate that she was able to make it here today and talk to us about her research, and that this time there wasn't an ice storm preventing you from getting here. <laughs> uh, so first of all, can everybody hear me? Yeah? Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Janine and, and Khalil for the very kind invitation to come here. I was actually supposed to be here in February. We had one inch of snow in Birmingham, Alabama, and that shut down our airport. So it was very embarrassing for me to tell them that I was not coming because of, of our major snowstorm, that we, we don't have any snow plows or anything. Um, so I, I'm, it, it's really an honor uh, to be here and, and a little bit intimidating also to talk about uh, protein kinase CK2 in, in front of uh, world experts in the area, but I will, I will do my best. So what I'll tell you about today, just give you a brief introduction on CK2, a brief introduction on glioblastoma, and then talk about some of our published work on the role of CK2 in GBM. And then I'm going to do a, like a 180 and transition into multiple sclerosis, and I will tell you why we're making that transition. Talk about the role of T cells in MS and their development, and then some very recent and unpublished data on the role of CK2 in T cell differentiation and autoimmunity, and then conclude. So um, always most important to start off by thanking uh, the people that actually do the work. And uh, the, the work on CK2 and autoimmunity is done by very talented graduate students, Sarah Gibson uh, shown here, uh, assisted by other people in the lab. and. As Janine mentioned, we have interests in Parkinson's disease, in MS, and in brain tumors. And our funding sources are listed uh, below. So um, protein kinase C, uh, formerly known as casein kinase 2, a highly conserved serine threonine kinase that is ubiquitously expressed and, in contrast to uh, other kinases, uh, has constitutive activity. Um, it is composed of a tetrameric complex made up of two catalytic subunits, alpha and or alpha prime, and two regulatory beta subunits. Um, I, I really became acquainted with CK2 about, I want to say, six years ago. I had a graduate student come to my lab who, for um, a variety of reasons, had an interest in CK2, and I had never even heard of the kinase. So, um, 
<coughs> the literature on CK2 is, is vast. I think there's actually still a lot we don't know. Um, first and foremost, when I started reading the literature, it was all about the fact that CK2 functions as a tetramer, but now there's a great appreciation that the alpha, alpha prime, and beta um, subunits can also exert biological functions independently, which I think is a really fascinating area. Uh, CK2 is an extremely promiscuous kinase, has over 450 known substrates, and that number's probably gone up since I made this slide. And most of the literature on CK2 happens to be in the cancer field. And we know in many cancers that there are increased levels of CK2 protein, increased kinase activity, nuclear localization. Uh, and this is also true for the cancer that we're interested in, which is glioblastoma. And so the alpha and alpha prime subunits are the catalytic subunits and thus far have been the major target for uh, pharmacological intervention. The beta regulatory subunits uh, stabilize the tetramer. As I mentioned, they can also function independently. They modulate enzyme activity and can dictate substrate specificity. Um, and this is how I envision sort of in a homeostatic state that you have uh, equivalent ratios, if you will, of the alpha and beta subunits. And particularly in the context of cancer with overexpression of alpha or alpha prime and perhaps a reduction in the beta subunits that you have a promotion towards tumor growth. So there are many beautiful reviews out on CK2, and again, mostly in the field of cancer. And if you put CK2 in, in the, the, the middle here of the slide, you can appreciate that it, it affects functionality that allows for the promotion of tumor growth. Anti-apoptotic activity, inactivation of tumor suppressors, promotion of angiogenesis, promotion of immune uh, evasion, and also affecting the growth and proliferation of tumor cells. And this is due to its ability to modulate, actually for many reasons, but of our particular interest is the ability of CK2 to modulate many signaling pathways that are instrumental in tumor growth. And the three that we've been particularly interested, on, interested in are the PI3 kinase, mTOR pathway, the NF-kappa-B pathway, and the JAK-STAT pathway. So we showed a few years ago that CK2 could potentiate the activation of the JAK-STAT pathway uh, by interaction and phosphorylation of JAK kinases. CK2 is also a positive activator of the NF-kappa-B pathway, <coughs> excuse, me, by, <coughs> excuse me, by a variety of mechanisms. And CK2 also functions as a positive activator of the PI3 kinase pathway by inhibiting uh, P10 activity, uh, which is a negative repressor of the PI3 kinase pathway. And also one of the hallmarks of CK2 is its ability to phosphorylate serine 129 of AKT, which promotes its catalytic activity. So just to give you a little bit of introduction on glioblastoma, uh, this is also known as a grade four astrocytoma. It makes up uh, about 40 to 45% of intracranial tumors in adults. Um, it, it is a, a very grim cancer. Um, mean survival post-diagnosis, even after many, many years of research, remains at 12 to 15 months. So when people are diagnosed with GBM, the first thing is if it's amenable to surgery, to do maximal surgical resection, plus radiotherapy, <coughs> plus uh, treatment with temozolomide. But the hallmark of GBMs is that you, you never, it's not a, a, a well-circumscribed cancer. The surgeons can never remove all of the tumor. And the, the cells that are left behind are very invasive. And uh, GBM is really the hallmark is characterized by this invasive capacity of the cells and ultimately reoccurrence. Um, there are a few patients that have survived uh, long term, but they have very serious cognitive impairment um, from the effects of radiotherapy. 
And our interest in glioblastoma, again, has been the signaling cascades that promote its growth. And shown here in cartoon form, we've done work, again, on all three of these pathways and have shown that there is aberrant activation of these three signaling pathways, as well as others in GBM. And you can appreciate that activation of the NF-kappa B pathway promotes cell survival, proliferation, and inflammation. The same is true for activation of the JAK-STAT pathway, which also promotes anti-apoptotic events and angiogenesis. And activation of the AKT pathway is very important for cell survival, migration, and differentiation. And we know that all three of these pathways are activated due to a variety of biological mechanisms, including overactivation of positive regulators and or deletion or mutation of negative regulators of the pathway. So we became interested, or actually I should say my former graduate student, Ying Zhang, became interested in uh, what was the status um, of CK2 and GBM. So she embarked on a number of studies to look at mRNA levels of CK2 subunits, copy number variation. Uh, she looked at the functional implications of GBM uh, by inhibiting CK2 kinase inhibitor, inhibitor, uh, inhibiting CK2 kinase activity with a, a small molecule inhibitor as well as using siRNA to knock down uh, CK2 protein expression. We've also looked at the influence of CK2 on brain tumor initiating uh, cell function. Uh, these are considered the stem cells that promote uh, GBM growth, as well as looking at the role of, of CK2 in in vivo models. So in data that was published in 2013, um, we used the um, uh, TCGA portal for glioblastoma and determined that there was amplification of the gene that encodes for CK2 alpha was amplified in about 34% of uh, GBM tumor samples. And this amplification of gene dosage, dosage was also associated with an increase in mRNA levels and this was determined looking at, at two different data sets from the Broad Institute as well as UNC. So we have amplification of the CK2 alpha gene as well as increase in mRNA level. Now, um, we also did this for CK2 alpha prime, the other cat <clears throat> catalytic subunit, and saw that it was amplified in only 2.8%. And interestingly, CK2 beta, uh, encoding for the regulatory subunit, was deleted in 14.1% of uh, patients. I'm not going to show you any of the data on CK2 beta, but we do think that it, it may function as a tumor suppressor in GBM. Okay. So one of the approaches we've used to study the role of CK2 is using the drug known as CX4945. This is the first CK2 inhibitor to enter the clinic. Uh, it is a potent, uh, relatively selective ATP competitive inhibitor of both of the catalytic subunits. And um, the models that we've used to study GBM, oops, went one too far, are shown here. We're very fortunate to have a brain tumor animal model core in which all patients that are operating on for GBM, a portion of their tumor comes to this core and is immediately put into the flank of a nude mouse. So these tumors are, this, this tumor material never touches plastic. And the advantage here is that by growing these tumors in the flanks of nude mice is that they retain hallmark mutations um, of GBMs, which is amplification of the EGFR receptor, uh, mutant form of e EGFR V3, P53. Um, if you culture them on plastic, they will lose these hallmarks. If we culture them in vivo, they don't. And so we think this is a great model for um, more clinically relevant uh, sampling uh, testing of human GBM. So this is the scheme here. We can then um, 
extract the tumor from the flank of the mouse, do short-term in vitro analysis, subcutaneous flank models, as well as intracranial tumors. And so just as one example of some of the, the data that we've obtained, one of the first things we were interested in was whether uh, inhibiting CK2 had any effect on the jax <coughs> pathway. Uh, we've done this with a, a variety of these xenografts. And what you can appreciate is that there is constitutive activation of, of STAT3, which is a downstream transcription factor that's activated in this pathway. This is phosphorylated on a tyrosine residue. And inclusion of the CX compound gave us a very strong inhibitory effect. We can use stimuli that will activate the JAK, uh, JAK-STAT pathway, such as interleukin-6. We see enhanced STAT3 activation. <coughs> and also an inhibitory effect. Upstream of the stat transcription factors are the JAK kinases themselves. These are tyrosine kinases. And you can appreciate, again, we see an inhibitory effect on phosphorylation of JAK2. Now, signaling through EGF is a very uh, potent mitogen for GBM tumor growth. And EGF activates many signaling cascades but it also is an activator of the JAK-STAT pathway, particularly STAT5 and STAT3. And what you can appreciate is that we see activation of both STAT5 and STAT3, which is inhibited in a dose-dependent manner. But I think you can appreciate that the inhibition of, of STAT3 is much more pronounced than that of, of STAT5. So there is some selectivity. So just to summarize a lot of data that was in that clinical cancer research paper, we looked at all of these pathways and, and found that there was, again, the aberrant activation of all of them, and the inclusion of the CX compound would inhibit CK2 activity, would dampen signaling through the NF-kappa-B pathway, through the JAK-STAT pathway, and through the uh, mTOR pathway. So there's a lot of interest in the cancer field in the role of stem cells and, and their ability to really um, serve as, as the likeliest cause of tumor resistance. <coughs> so in the GBM field, uh, these cells go by many names. I like tum uh, brain tumor initiating cells, BTICs. Um, BTICs uh, can be uh, identified and purified by expression of a uh, cell surface marker known as CD133. BTICs are highly resistant to chemotherapy and radiation therapy, as I said, are the likeliest cause of tumor recurrence, express markers of neural precursor cells, and are capable of differentiating amongst many lineages. So what we've done is, is to ask what is the role of CK2 in these uh, BTICs. So we, we sort for them, we enrich them. And here we're looking for stemness factors, such as SOX2 and Nestin, which, which really mark these cells. And I think you can uh, appreciate here that the inclusion of the CX compound gives us a partial inhibitory effect on these stemness factors. And, and perhaps more striking for implicating a role for CK2 in these BTICs is um, looking at neurosphere formation. So this is a limiting dilution analysis. And what I want you to appreciate is this line here are the number of sort of neurospheres that are formed under basal conditions. And when there is an inhibitory <coughs> effect, your slope goes, goes upwards. So here we're looking, again, at a variety of these GBM xenografts. We're looking at neurosphere formation. And here we see that the inclusion of the CX compound in a dose-dependent manner inhibits neurosphere formation. And we've, we've also repeated this uh, result using siRNA to knock down both CK2-alpha and CK2-alpha prime, and we see the same effect. And this is very reassuring, because using pharmacological inhibitors alone uh, really uh, opens you up for criticism regarding the specificity of those compounds. So if we go to in vivo models, we first started with, with a flank model with this particular xenograph. And again, what you can appreciate is um, treatment with the CX compound significantly reduces tumor size. And when we extract these tumors at day 40, 
you can see that in the vehicle control treated uh, GBMs that there is activation of the JAK-STAT pathway, the N-Capogen <coughs> pathway, the PI3 kinase AKT pathway, which is significantly uh, inhibited in the tumors that were excised from the mice treated with the CX compound. But this is a flank model, so you know, how relevant is that to anything? Um, so the, the, really the gold standard in the GBM field are to do these intracranial models where we implant these uh, patient-derived xenografts uh, in the brains of nude mice. And so that's what we're doing here. Uh, we've done this with a variety of xenografts. The CX compound is given by oral gavage. And again, I think you can appreciate that there is a significant survival advantage in the mice that receive the CX compound. And again, uh, using this, uh, this tumor model and oral gavage of um, the CX compound, we again see an inhibitory effect uh, looking within the tumor on activation of the JAK-STAT pathway, the NF-kappa-B pathway, and the AKT pathway. And um, one of the things that, that we've been asked about, and this is, of course, relevant for any type of treatment that you're interested in for a neurological disease, is does your drug get across the blood-brain barrier? So uh, in collaboration with Heike Rebolt uh, in New York, uh, she did an experiment uh, in, in just naive mice with an intact blood-brain barrier uh, doing an intraperitoneal injection of the CX compound at these different doses, and then isolating um, brain tissue 30 minutes and 120 minutes um, after injection. And again, I call your attention to the serine 129. This is a specific CK2 phosphorylation site in AKT, and compared to its constitutive phosphorylation in control brain, I think you can appreciate that there is a substantial inhibitory effect um, on, on this phosphorylation site as well as serine 473. So these data do suggest to us, although we still have a lot more work to do, that the CX compound is able to cross an intact blood-brain barrier. So from this part of the work, um, I've shown you that the gene that encodes CK2-alpha is frequently amplified in human GBM, and that inhibition of CK2 uh, kinase activity by the CX compound, as well as knockdown of CK2 expression by siRNA, suppresses activation of the JAK-STAT, the NF-kappa-B, and the AKT signaling pathway, and downstream gene expression in human GBM, as well as affecting other functions of GBM cells, such as proliferation and migration. Stemness gene expression in BTIX is also suppressed by inhibition of CK2, as is the expression in data that I didn't show you of CD133, one of the major markers of these stem cells. And importantly, neurosphere formation is significantly suppressed uh, by CX treatment or inhibition of CK2 expression, suggesting the importance of CK2 in the ability of these stem cells to self-renew and perhaps uh, propagate disease. And I also showed you that in both flank and intracranial <clears throat> models of GBM that inhibiting CK2 activity has a, be a beneficial effect with reductions in tumor volume and increased survival. And also, uh, our data does suggest um, that the CX compound is able to cross an intact blood-brain barrier as evidenced by the suppression of AKT phosphorylation. And we are currently in the process of hoping to get a phase one clinical trials uh, in, in GBM patients that have recurred um, uh, for treatment with the CX compound. And this is in collaboration with Dr. Bert Neighbors, who's a neuro-oncologist at UAB. Okay, so now we're going to do the, the total 180 switch. Um, other aspects of my lab are interested <clears throat> in the role of, of the immune system in CNS diseases. And so we're interested in cells of both the innate 
an adaptive immune system in the context of the autoimmune disease of multiple sclerosis. And just to try to provide the rationale for why I'm taking you down this path, uh, we know from the immunology literature that signaling through the JAK-STAT, NF-kappa-B, and PI3 kinase mTOR pathways, the pathways that we've just been talking about in the context of cancer, are critical for the growth and differentiation of immune cells. So if we put this cartoon back up, and before this said CK2 and cancer, so now there's a question mark, and that is CK2 and immune cell development. Because as I've shown you, CK2 is a positive activator of all of these signaling cascades, which are important for immune cell development. And this is where um, Sarah Gibson started her project. Um, and she, she basically uh, undertook a, a study really to ask if there's any role of CK2 in the immune system, and more importantly, in an animal model of multiple sclerosis, which is known as experimental allergic encephalomyelitis. So let me introduce you first to multiple sclerosis. It's an inflammatory demyelinating disease of the central nervous system uh, with debilitating motor and sensory dysfunction as well as cognitive dysfunction. The statistics are there. Now, the really wonderful thing uh, about the field of MS is that there are actually 12 FDA-approved drugs. These are mostly drugs that promote immunosuppression. But MS is an extremely heterogeneous disease, and so certain patients will be responsive to certain drugs, and over time, they will become refractive. So although the, we, we do have a lot out there for treating MS patients, there's, there's still a tremendous interest in, uh, in finding new therapies. The pathological features of MS include a very pronounced infiltration of immune cells from the periphery, demyelination, gliosis, which is the hyperactivation of astrocytes in the CNS, lesion formation or scar formation, and neurodegeneration. And so here you can see this, these are the uh, infiltrating immune cells around a blood vessel. Um, this stain here, Luxol Fast Blue, detects myelin, where it is white, that is the loss of myelin. Uh, axonal loss, and this profound gliosis. So we actually do not know what causes MS, uh, but we do know there's a very important contribution of the immune system. There is a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, which allows for the infiltration of inflammatory immune cells. These are cells of the myeloid lineage, macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, as well as cells of the adaptive immune system, CD4 positive T cells, which come in many subsets that have different functions, CD8 positive T cells, and B cells. <clears throat> Within the CNS, there's a number of glial cell alterations, as I mentioned, astrogliosis. Oligo oligodendrocytes are the cells that produce myelin. They are either damaged or lost, uh, resulting in demyelination and microglia, which are the endogenous brain macrophage, become highly activated and can take on many uh, immune functions. Also, uh, significant neuronal damage, and this was actually not that well appreciated. MS has always been considered a demyelinating disease, but that the axons were intact, and all you really had to do was promote remyelination and everything would be fine. That actually is not the case. We know that, that there is comparable to other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, significant axonal loss and neuronal death. And as well, due to this influx of immune cells into the central, system, uh, central nervous system, that's at, there is aberrant cytokine and chemokine expression. And so I don't know how well you can see this, um, but this is just to, to remind you that the disease starts outside of the central nervous system. All of us in this room have T cells that are autoreactive for components of the myelin sheath. Um, there is, is something, there's, there's a genetic predisposition, there's environmental factors in patients that have MS. 
that will promote the activation of these autoreactive T cells in the periphery, which leads to their activation, the production of matrix metalloproteinases, um, and, and also causes their homing into the central nervous system, presumably because the antigen of interest is in the CNS. So now what you have here, uh, the T cells make MMPs. This helps to break down the, bl the blood-brain barrier. And this allows for the influx of immune cells, which now take up residence within the CNS. And what this is meant to depict is once these immune cells get into the CNS, you have a very complex microenvironment with these infiltrating immune cells, endogenous glial cells. You have neurons. You have the production of neurotransmitters, cytokines, chemokines. And the bottom line in MS patients, what you have is a sort of chronic um, overactivation of the immune system that contributes to demyelination and neuronal loss. So, so do, do we have any T cell experts in the room? Not a one. Okay. So let me, um, let me tell you about T cells, which are really quite complicated. Well, I'll give you the, the simplified version. So you have a naive T cell, and on its surface will be a marker known as CD4 as well as a T cell receptor. So T cells get activated by engagement of uh, CD4 and uh, TCR by an antigen presenting cell. This would be a macrophage, a dendritic cell. Um, very complicated process, but then, by virtue of the cytokines that this T cell will encounter, you can get the differentiation into many different subsets of T cells. And this is actually a, an outdated version. Um, two of the major T cell subsets that we're interested in are known as Th1 cells. These are, these are naive cells that have encountered the cytokines interleukin-12 and gamma interferon. They go through a differentiation process. They express a transcription factor known as TBET that marks Th1 cells. And their hallmark cytokine that they produce is gamma interferon. These Th1 cells are very important for macrophage activation and promoting inflammation. Another T cell uh, subset is Th17s. These are induced in the presence of IL-6, TGF-beta, and actually not shown here, interleukin-1 and IL-23, so a complex cytokine milieu. They express a transcri transcription factor known as ROR gamma T. That is a hallmark of Th17 cells. And they produce interle uh, interleukin-17 A and F. That is their hallmark cytokine. And these cells are also involved in promoting inflammation. Now, on the other side of the spectrum are what are known as T regulatory cells. These become uh, differentiated in the presence of IL-2 and TGF-beta. They express a transcription factor known as FOXP3. Their signature cytokine is interleukin-10. And they are anti-inflammatory. Um, uh, anti so they suppress inflammatory responses. And in the context of many autoimmune diseases, including MS, your Th17 cells and Th1 cells are the pathogenic effector cells, while the T regulatory cells are your protective cells. OK. So to get this activation of T cells through the T cell receptor, as I showed you, and then signaling through all these different cytokine receptors, those three pathways that we've talked about need to be activated. NF-kappa-B, PI3 kinase, mTOR, and the JAK-STAT pathway. So Sarah asked, would there be any role for CK2 in modulating the ability of T cells to differentiate? So the first thing she did was to simply ask, if we activate a T cell, now we're not at this point polarizing to any T cell subset, but simply activating them uh, with, with two different antibodies. 
and we look at uh, activation of both uh, the mTORC1 pathway and mTORC2, what you can see is there is very strong activation in a time-dependent manner, as shown here, which is substantially inhibited in the presence of the CX compound at 2 micromole. So the inhibitory effects on this S6 kinase, as shown here, reflect an inhibitory effect on the mTORC1 pathway and the inhibitory effect on AKT serine 473 reflects an inhibitory effect on mTORC2. So one of the other pathways that's very critical for T cell development um, is the, the JAK-STAT pathway, particularly STAT3, which is critical for the differentiation of Th17 cells. And by FACTS analysis, what um, Sarah has shown is that the inclusion of the CX compound can inhibit the activation of STAT3. And in this particular experiment, she polarized a naive T cell to a TH17 phenotype using this cocktail of cytokines and asked in a time-dependent manner about expression of ROR gamma T. This is a transcription factor that marks TH17 cells. And you can see that in a time-dependent manner, ROR gamma T expression increases, which is inhibited by the CX compound. So this was encouraging data suggesting that there may, in fact, uh, be a role for, for CK2 in T cell development. So the next thing uh, Sarah did was to simply ask, what, what do expression levels of CK2 look like in T cells? And so this is very striking in contrast to what one normally sees in cancer cells where you have very high constitutive uh, expression. So this is looking at CK2 alpha protein expression in naive T cells. There actually is some there, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But with activation, this really pronounced enhancement of CK2 uh, alpha protein expression. This is also mirrored at the level of um, mRNA expression. Here we're polarizing to the Th1 and Th17 phenotypes, and we see an enhancement. And um, in this, this is um, an image stream analysis of CK2 alpha. Here are naive T cells, and I think you can appreciate in the naive state that we do have low levels of CK2 alpha expression. However, when the cells are polarized to the Th17 phenotype, expression is uh, substantially enhanced. Okay. So in this experiment, um, Sarah polarized these naive T cells, which have low levels of CK2 alpha as assessed by FACTS analysis, to the Th1 and Th17 cell phenotype. And she sorted on <coughs> cells that were positive for Tbet, which is a transcription factor that marks Th1 cells and ROR gamma T that marks Th17 cells, and saw that those two uh, differentiated T cells did in fact have elevated levels of CK2 alpha expression. And importantly, we needed to document that this enhancement of CK2 alpha protein expression actually correlated with enhanced kinase activity and it does, because there's been instances where increased levels of CK2 actually don't correlate with enhanced kinase activity. So this was important to show. Okay, so if we again go back to these, these three cell types, so here we have our naive cell, and depending on the cytokine milieu, we'll get the Th1 uh, phenotype or Th17 phenotype. And what I want to stress is, is in the context of autoimmunity, these are considered the pathogenic effector cells. And in contrast, too much animation there. In contrast, our T regulatory cells are immunosuppressive and thought to be protective in many autoimmune diseases. So again, the question was, if we inhibit CK2 activity, what happens to the ability of a naive T cell 
to polarize into these three different T cell subsets. Okay. So when we polarize to the Th1 phenotype, our readout is the production of the cytokine gamma interferon. And that is what you see up here. This is fax analysis for gamma interferon production. And this is the percentage of cells expressing gamma interferon. This is a four-day polarization. And we are adding the CX compound one time and one time only at the beginning of this culture. So here we can see that there is essentially no change in the ability of, of Th1 cells to differentiate. Uh, we've repeated this experiment many times, and the bottom line is that CK2 kinase activity does not appear to be involved in Th1 cell differentiation. But we saw a very different um, result looking at Th17 cells. So again, Th17 cells are polarized in their cocktail, and the readout is IL-17A protein expression by fax analysis. So these are the numbers of Th17 cells that have developed in this in vitro culture. And what you can appreciate is that with the inclusion of the CX compound, again, adding it at day zero, we're measuring four days later, a, a substantial inhibitory effect on Th17 differentiation. All right, so here's where things get a little confusing. What I didn't mention is that T cell polarization is very plastic. So once you become one particular cell type, you don't necessarily stay there. So again, depending on the cytokines, you can de-differentiate, you can acquire other phenotypes, which is what makes this whole T cell feel pretty crazy. So I say that <clears throat> to tell you that even when we polarize to the TH17 phenotype, we actually see a certain percentage of T regulatory cells. So this kind of doesn't make sense because TH17 cells do one thing and T regs do a totally different thing. Nonetheless, what we saw is that the percentage of T regulatory cells was actually enhanced when CK2 activity was inhibited. So if we now go to panel C, using the classical differentiation scheme for T regulatory cells, we also see that the inclusion of the CX compound enhances the differentiation and polarization of T regulatory cells. And this is just to show you, again, we're looking at Th17 cell differentiation, as shown here. When we add the CX compound at time zero, looking four hours later, we see an inhibitory effect. And we can add it as late as 24 hours, still see an uh, inhibitory effect. We start to lose it at about 48 hours. And one thing, you know, that was an obvious question is, are we just killing off our Th17 cells? That could certainly be a possibility. So here we're looking at T cell proliferation um, with vehicle control as well as the CX compound. I think you can appreciate that there's not a substantial effect on the ability of these cells to proliferate. Okay, so this in vitro data suggests that CK2 kinase activity is important for the ability of a Th17 cell to polarize, and that it also represses the development of T regulatory cells. So as I mentioned, these are cells that are very important in MS, as well as the animal model of MS, which is EAE. So uh, EAE um, is, can be induced in, there's many different models, can be induced in many different ways. What I'm going to show you data on is what's called active EAE, and this is where mice, these are, <clears throat> excuse me, C57 black 6, are immunized with neoantigens. Um, what happens in a, a time-dependent manner is a disease course that I'll show you in just a moment. What we know is that EAE is caused by CD4 positive T cell mediated immune responses directed against the myelin sheath, important contributions from macrophages and microglia. And again, the Th1 and Th17 cells are the pathogenic cells. T 
Tregs and TH2s are the uh, immunosuppressant. So there's an initiation stage in which there's activation and expansion of autoreactive T cells outside of the CNS, and then the effector stage in which these T cells have now crossed the blood-brain barrier and have taken up residence within the central nervous system. So in this experiment, uh, Sarah uh, did the immunization. Here we're using a MOG peptide. And this is the course of disease, onset, progression, peak, resolution. And these are, it's a great model because you can actually see the, the clinical symptoms and score them. What she did was to, to isolate cells on day nine. So this is uh, sort of pre-onset. And ask about what cells that are important in EAE um, might express CK2 alpha. So what you can <clears throat> appreciate is that we saw high levels of CK2 alpha at day nine in the draining lymph nodes, and this is one of the immune organs in which these T cells are becoming hyperactivated. If you go longer, now she sacrificed uh, mice um, during disease <coughs> progression, as shown here. And again, looking in the draining lymph nodes, you can see that CK2 alpha expression has diminished. But rather, when we look at the T cells that are isolated from the central nervous system of mice with active disease in spinal cord and brain, we see higher levels of CK2 alpha. Now, if she does an experiment where she pretreats these animals with the CX compound at 20 mg per keg, again by oral gavage, and then does the MOG immunization and sacrifices them at day nine, what she wanted to ask in this experiment was whether treatment with the CX compound could affect any of these signaling cascades or T cell differentiation in vivo. So at day nine, she isolated uh, T cells, CD4 positive T cells from the spleen. And again, I think you can appreciate that there is a decrease in AKT phosphorylation, as well as other substrates of the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway. When she also looked at uh, cells from the draining lymph nodes, she isolated uh, T cells and polarized them. We can appreciate that there is a decrease in the percentage of Th17 cells, whereas there was no uh, difference in Th1s, which is very comparable to what we saw in vitro. And perhaps more importantly, we can isolate these infiltrating immune cells from the <coughs> spinal cord, and again, polarize them and ask what is their uh, differentiation status. So polarizing to the uh, Th17 <coughs> phenotype, we saw that in the spinal cord, here we have 14% TH17 cells, which is decreased to 1.6% uh, with mice that received the CX treatment. And another subset of T cells that are considered very pathogenic are those that are called double positives. So they, they actually produce both IL-17 and gamma interferon, as shown here. And this double positive subset is also inhibited by the CX compound. So this led Sarah to perform an in vivo experiment using the CX compound to see what effect it might have on EAE disease development. This is a, a uh, the, the mice are pretreated with the CX compound for one week and then we immunize them. And here's the disease course and you can appreciate that the mice that received the CX compound did not have any delay in onset but had reduced disease severity, which when we look in the spinal cord was actually associated with an increase in Tregs, the immunosuppressive cell type. But the more important experiment was to do more of a therapeutic application of the CX compound. And in this experiment, uh, Sarah started treatment at day 11 in which the mice are already starting to show signs of disease. And uh, this is really a very preliminary experiment, but we saw a, a decrease in disease severity. So that, again, has all been positive, but we are using a pharmacological inhibitor. And so what we really want to do is ask what happens when we specifically modulate CK2 alpha expression in vivo. So for these experiments, 
Sarah has generated a mouse that are deficient in CK2 alpha, specifically in CD4 positive T cells. And again, these are very preliminary experiments, but I did want to show you that we're seeing the same trend. So if we, if we take out the cells from these mice that are lacking CD4 only in their T cell population, and we do the, the polarization to the Th1 phenotype, we see actually in this particular exper experiment massive differentiation to Th1s with some small inhibitory effect. When she polarized in vitro to the Th17 phenotype, <clears throat> again in, in T cells, <clears throat> excuse me, lacking CK2 alpha, we see a significant reduction in Th17 cell differentiation. Under these same conditions, we also get T regulatory cells, which are enhanced. And when we do the classic polarization for T regulatory cells in mice lacking CK2 alpha, we see an enhancement. So to conclude, I've shown you that um, <clears throat> we think that, that CK2 may have a very novel role in regulating CD4-positive T-cell differentiation. The major catalytic subunit, CK2-alpha, is induced upon T-cell activation. It remains high in mature T-cells and is associated with elevated kinase activity. If we inhibit CK2 kinase activity with the CX compound, this promotes the development of FOXP3 T regulatory cells and also inhibits the polarization and differentiation of Th17 cells both in vitro and in vivo using the EAE disease model. Therapeutic treatment with the CX compound reduces the severity of EAE and this protection in data I didn't show you is associated with an increased frequency in Treds and a reduction in Th17 cells. And preliminary data suggests that T cells deficient in CK2 alpha are defective in their ability to polarize to the Th17 phenotype and have enhanced polarization to the Treg phenotype. So these data implicate CK2 as a positive activator of Th17 cells and a negative regulator of Tregs. And in, in many diseases, primarily autoimmune disease, what you really want to do is alter the, the ratios of these cells, um, decreasing the ratio of Th17 cells to Tregs. And so we think that CK2 may be a very attractive target for altering the balance between Th17 and Tregs. But there's actually an important caveat, and that is I've shown you examples of CK2 in cancer and autoimmunity. And the cells that we've talked about do totally different things in those two settings. So again, in the, in the, the context of autoimmunity, the inhibition of CK2 appears to be beneficial. But what are the implications for cancer? So we know that T regulatory cells in cancer are critically important in tumor progression. And this inhibitory effect of CK2 may actually provoke the tumorigenic function of T regulatory cells. Now I showed you data in a nude mouse that inhibition of CK2 was protective, but we don't have T cells in those models. So that's a, a major um, sort of uh, shortcoming. Our preliminary data indicate that CK2 inhibition dampens the activation of M1 polarized macrophages. M1 polarized macrophages promote inflammation, so if you inhibited them, that would be beneficial in autoimmunity, but M1 macrophages are anti-tumorigenic, so that would be detrimental in the context of cancer. And so what I think is, is important as we go forward is you really have to, especially in, in the, the context of a cancer setting, setting, you really have to ask what are the effects of your target of interest in the tumor cells as well as the immune cells that make up such a, a large proportion of the tumor microenvironment. So I'll leave you with that because I know there's another meeting. And thank you very much for your attention.
Yes. Uh, fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, we've known, obviously, for a long time that <coughs> MS is one of the few autoimmune diseases that is, is induced by cells rather than antibodies. And um, from your data, I gather you think that it's much more related to the C17 than the TH4. Is that correct? Yes. And, yes. and obviously the uh, fact that TH17 and Tregs are mutually exclusive explains a lot of what you've been found. Is that, is that your interpretation? That's my interpretation. Okay. Right. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Are you aware of any data of CK2 inhibitors being used in various immunological uh, disorders in contrast to autoimmune disorders? Yeah, so the only data I could find was a, um, a paper using CK2 inhibitor in a fibrosis model, which was beneficial. And I think there was also one paper you guys would know better than I. I think there was one in a in a kidney, an inflammatory kidney model. But those are the only two that I've seen. Um, so I think the field's fully wide open in that regard. I was wondering, uh, what's the, how is uh, CK2 distributed in the glioma cells? Is it, uh, you know, like in many models that we have studied, it's more concentrated in the nucleus of cancer. I was wondering if you observed similar. Yeah, so, um, so in, in many cancers, CK2 alpha in particular tends to be more localized in the nucleus. You know, interestingly, it depends on the glioma <coughs> cell. Well, so there's, there's many different subtypes of GBMs uh, based on genetic markers, and we have found that in some of the sub subtypes, <coughs> CK2 alpha is predominantly in the nucleus, but in other subtypes, We've seen both nuclear and cytoplasmic distribution. But we've never seen exclusively cytoplasmic. Yes. Have you looked at the CK2 distribution in the cells in the experimental animal model brain lesions at all? So we are and how do you see in addition to the dampening effect, do you also see a reduction in the normal loss? So those are ongoing experiments that Sarah is doing, hopefully as we speak. I mean, I, I think it'll be fascinating to see what what is that beneficial effect due to, and and more importantly to your point, uh, if there was any you know, so, so the, the the big thing in MS is not only to suppress the immune response but to promote remyelination, right, and, and hopefully yeah. inhibit neuronal loss so exactly. you don't get. Um, yeah. accretion of um, neuronal loss. And you showed activity in both the spine as well as in the central nervous system. We, we look at we can we look at brain separately from the spinal cord. Right, because a lot of the really debilitating progressive forms are localized much more in the spine than yes. in the brain, but the cognitive issues reside in the brain. Exactly. So. Exactly. <clears throat> Yeah, and that's why we actually look at those two areas separately, because they, they do manifest as very different disease states. So the elevation in CK2 and the T cell activation, is it because of new protein synthesis, or? Yeah, yeah. Just we haven't done that experiment. We should just try that, I don't know. So in the glioma model, I was uh, noticing, at least from the data you showed, that it looks like there's differential potency with CK2 compound, as far as how Far it down there, it's one of the three pathways. Jack's stat looked like it was probably the most sensitive. I think he showed a little bit of differential sensitivity in the treated animals. I was wondering if you had considered or tried actually synergistic uh, combinations with mTOR inhibitors or anything else to look at how that affects tumor progression and tumor growth in that model. So, so we're using the CX compound in combination with some of the mTOR inhibitors, and we're also using it with some of the EGFR inhibitors. And at least in vitro so far, it looks like there is either an additive and or synergistic effect. How long can you keep the tumor in the flank going and still be able to express very various genes, for example? So, so some, of these, some of these xenografts have been carried for seven years. 
really expensive, really, <laughs> really <laughs> labor intensive, <laughs> but it's a great model, except with the caveat that you have to use it in a new mouse. I think they want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all.